18-year-old lifeguard Palmer Malarkey had become trapped underwater when his arm was caught in a pool drain. When his friend and fellow lifeguard V.J. Heinrichs dove in to help, he was unable to free Palmer. That's frantic. I ran for the phone. 911 emergency. Yes, this is Miss Anna Missy's call came into the county communication center at 1.49 p.m. Okay, Missy, we're dispatching for an ambulance now. Station 800, ambulance and QRT. The male subject trapped in the pool and the water for approximately two minutes. Dispatch question. I started panicking and pulled another time, came to the surface, and I'm gasping for air. And then somebody goes, you know, turn off the pumps. I didn't know if that was going to work or not. It's just like, just turn off the whole system. I didn't know if he was still alive. And I'm like, he has to breathe. He has no air. So I gave him the rest of the breath that I had in me. EJ had already turned off the pump. I guess the pump had not stopped pulling because he still couldn't free him. He wasn't moving, there was no bubbles, there was nothing. Off-duty paramedic John Powell was at home, only four blocks away, when he heard the ambulance dispatched. His arm seemed to be stuck, but it immediately came free, and we proceeded to the surface. In the back of my mind, I was afraid that this person was dead, and there was very little we could do for him. Palmer had been trapped underwater for nearly six minutes. I've never seen something like that before. There's nothing there. It just seemed lifeless. I started giving an abdominal thrust to the stomach, trying to get some of the water out of there. And then we started CPR. <laughs> Fire Chief Darrell Churchill also responded from his house, less than a mile away from the pool. In about the first minute uh, that we had Palmer out of the pool, he did regain a spontaneous pulse. Even though he was breathing and had a pulse at this point, there was still a lot of concern that this individual could actually proceed to go down the hill and actually end up dying again. That was our major reason uh, behind going with the helicopter transport. They took him away in the ambulance and I was just thinking, you know, what's supposed to happen from here? started to go into a seizure. This young man's already been without oxygen for the six to seven minutes, and now he's biting the, the one clear airway that we have going to him. Having seen a lot of life and death situations, I'm trying to not get real personally caught up in it. But it was, it was a real personal thing for most of the people involved. Palmer was loaded into the chopper and placed in the care of Chief Flight Nurse Julie Mullen. Okay. Yes, sir. We are in route to the hospital this time. We should be there in about uh, five minutes. Palmer, it's okay. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. Okay. Palmer's condition okay. continued to deteriorate. The only thing I can think of is what more can we do in this helicopter for him? There is um, a medication that physicians often use for people with brain injuries. Frequently it is not used in the near drowning patients. I knew I should probably consider this and I called Dr. Bell at medical control. We're bringing you an 18 year old male, apparently victim of a near drowning accident, fresh water. I'm seeing signs uh, of some brain swelling. I'd like to, to ask Dr. Bell for permission to administer mannitol. Yeah, Julie, give 100 a mannitol IV and call me back if there's a change. If the brain swells, it's got no place to swell to. 
and that puts pressure within the brain, which further injures it. And we gave him mannitol to cause the brain swelling to diminish. Dr. John Bell was on duty at the emergency room of St. Charles Medical Center. The first thing we did was paralyze him. We gave him a drug that, that intravenously that, that paralyzed him completely. Frothy pulmonary edema fluid coming out, and that's all I know at this point. He was consuming more oxygen than he really needed to be. We wanted to quiet him down. Palmer was still in a coma when Missy Sammy got to the hospital. I knew I probably wouldn't be able to see him, but I went anyways. A nurse came out to talk to me and she said that Palmer had regained consciousness. He couldn't talk, but he was making eye contact with people and they didn't see any signs of brain damage yet. So that was definitely the happiest moment. We walk in the door and Palmer's laying down and he, he looks up at me and he smiles. And it, was just, it was just like, wow, Palmer, you know, you're there. When I first came out of it, the priest was talking to me and he uh, asked me if I had any brain damage. So I had turned to the nurse and asked her if I had any brain damage because I wasn't quite sure. And uh, she didn't know. She said, I don't know. Well, I don't think I do. So I took care of that question. It has been almost a year since the accident. What we found out as a family is that you should not take life for granted because it can change in seconds and you don't have it. Life is a very precious thing. And uh, you don't know how precious until you almost lose it. I think children are, are meant to cope with our death, and, and that's just a natural thing in life. And I, have, um, I don't know how I ever would have coped if Palmer would have died. I'm very glad to be alive because uh, life is amazing. This earth is amazing, and life is full of magic. I was given the gift of life, which is magic. Next. There's potential for violence and danger every day, every minute.